it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be who I am today. This is how I found Islam. So for me, I did the typical 17 year old for the first part of my life. I was like everybody else. I went to a public high school. I used to hang out with Muslims. Uh, Muslims really didn't matter. I used to really have a horrible life. I didn't care about my deen, but I still always loved Allah. Whenever Ramadan would come around, I would always have this vibe of going to the masjid, praying tarawih, uh, fasting, like the Ramadan vibe really got me closer to Allah. But the second Eid came around, that's it, that kufi came off, that bow came off, and I didn't care that much. Fast forward to when I hit 17 years old. It was the last year of my high school. For us, high school finished at Sec 5. And then we go to something called Zijet. So in this story, it was three of my friends, me, Maris, and let's call the last one Mr. X. We found each other going to sign up to school. We go upstairs and you know, typical 17 years old, we joke each other, we insult each other. All the way back down, you know, they make fun of me. And I was the only one with a license. So I didn't want them to come into the car. So what I do is I lock the door. So Baris and Mr. X didn't want me to leave them, so they jump on the trunk of the car while I'm reversing. And I freaked out a bit because it was my dad's car, what are you guys doing? And when I come out of the car, they're both laughing and excited. And I'm wondering why they are. And I realized it's because it was fun. They found it like weird, they're sitting on a car. And I'm like, okay, that looks pretty cool. They're like, yo, let's do it again, let's do it again. And I'm like, okay, let's do it again. So now we take the empty part of the parking lot, because obviously still not school didn't start, and we start driving around. Bragis and Mr. X are sitting on the car and we're just driving around and at one point Mr. X falls and hurts his knee and we start laughing at him, we're joking at him and then Bagis also started to have his like learner permit so he's like okay let me drive and I want to try it so I sit on the car and me and Mr. X are sitting we drive and we're sitting on the trunk and we're freaking out but we're not going too fast we're going like a 10-15 kilometer an hour it's crazy I slip and I fall and I hurt my elbow and then they start laughing at me they come out of the car it was funny everybody we know you're we're young and now we're doing it again so i go back to the driver's seat that is going on the trunk and mr x also but this time this round is that moment where it changed my life that moment was i always question myself what if this moment never happened i get into the car i look in the rear view mirror they're both sitting i see two backs and I start driving. And we generally drive for about 100 meters before we stop or if somebody's not there anymore. So I drive about 100 meters and I look into the rear view mirrors and there's the back of somebody missing. <laughs> Baris fell off. And I come out of the car and I start laughing. Because Baris was laughing when I fell off and Mr. X fell off. And it was funny because we're like, ah, it's his turn. But let me give you guys an imagery. I come out of the driver's seat and I see Mr. X looking at Baris who's on the ground. Mr. X is laughing and so I'm laughing. But then Mr. X's face changes. And he starts not only not laughing but he starts worrying. And all that in a fraction while I'm walking towards him. But not only does he start worrying but he starts freaking out. So I'm like, what's happening? And I get there. Now, Baris was a very good soccer player. He actually was playing for a provincial level, planning to go to an international level. And so I get there and I see Baris on the ground and I see that his foot was twisted. I'm like, subhanAllah, he broke his foot. But then my eye continues looking up and I realize that his arm was twisted. And I'm like, subhanAllah, he broke his arm. And then I continue looking up and I see him breathing loud and his eyes are in the air. And I remember me and the guys that were there running and saying, Baris, Baris. And he was not responding. All of a sudden, I remember looking at Baris and how can I explain this better than, you know when you open a faucet, the water gushes out. The blood starts gushing out of his ear. And remember, we're 17 or 16 year olds and we don't know what to do. We call 
911, and so they say, have somebody hold his head, and I obviously right away ran on the floor, put my arm under his head. The, the blood was so thick, I had to open my fingers so they don't accumulate in my hands. And they say, turn his head opposite to where the blood's coming out, so I do that. And subhanAllah, I was just filled with blood, waiting for the ambulance to come, and we're freaking out, and every second, every minute, we're, we're scared. We don't know what's happening. And something comes out of Babis's ear that blocks the blood and we're like, okay good, at least something blocked it now. And it's crazy because I remember saying it happened, like I was not religious, but that was also the time it happened, it was on a lot. And it was my religious peak in those moments. And I'm like, Ya Allah, please help us. Ya Allah, alhamdulillah, his blood stopped. It stopped gushing out of his ear. I was so happy and I was waiting for the ambulance. Finally, the ambulance comes and they take Bagus, and I'm like, Alhamdulillah, that's it. He's gonna be okay. He's gonna have a broken leg, broken arm, and we're good. I remember the police came and they took me and they asked me who was driving the car, and I said I was the one driving the car, and they start questioning me and they're like, why did you do this, and etc. And we went to the police station. But Alhamdulillah, it came out the same night. A couple of days in, I'm very scared to go to the hospital to go visit Bagus, and I keep getting. <laughs> contrary explanations, people telling me he's doing good, people telling me he's doing bad, and I got really worried and not knowing how about this he's doing. And so I end up summing up the courage and talking to his brother and being like, Can I please come to the hospital? And his brother tells me, Yeah. And not only does he tell me, Yeah, but he tells me that we're not accepting any more visitors and you're going to be amongst the last. And I remember thinking, oh, okay, but this is going to come out, but this is going to be fine, this is it. Alhamdulillah, I'm going to go see him, I'm going to go apologize. I remember writing down an apology, yeah, but I guess I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it, you know, we were playing, but I guess this and that. I get to the hospital, and his brother's like, let's go for a walk. I go with a walk with him, and he talks to me, and he says, what happened? And so I explain this, and now we're playing. And he starts explaining. He says, but I guess had severe trauma and in that day he lost about three liters of blood and he said that his brain because of the shot grew and grew so much that there was no place in his skull that they had to break his skull I remember that walk being one of the heaviest walks in my life and I remember the reason why there was something that came to block the blood in his ear was probably because the brain pushed something out of his ear and subhanAllah I, I, I remember after that talk I was like okay can I just go see Bagus? I can't, I can't anymore I need to go see and so we go upstairs but not only we start going upstairs, but we pass the people that are a bit sick, we pass the people that are medium sick, we pass the people that are really sick, and then we get to people that are emergency, 24 hours, somebody there taking care of them. And so I entered the room and I look at Baris. It wasn't the Baris I recognized anymore. His head was twice the size. I was so scared. He was in a coma. And I look at his brother and I say, what happened? And he said, when that happened, his brain, we had to cut part of it. And the part of his brain that we cut was the part that was in charge of his movements, his actions, that even if Bagus were to live, he was gonna live like a vegetable for the rest of his life. And even his survival chances are so low. I remember sitting there and that's that's when it hit me. That's when I'm like, Ya Allah, what's happening? That's when I was like, I'm a bit confused. I'm scared. Ya Allah, please help me. And it was nearing the end of Ramadan and Eid was coming around the corner and I was getting confused. I made a lot of dua. Ya Allah, please help us. Ya Allah, please find us a solution. Ya Allah, please. And so, one week after the accident, the accident happened on a Friday, Saturday, I get the message. Ya Babis just passed. Now let me tell you who Babis is. Babis wasn't just a friend I knew from high school, Babis was my neighbor all throughout my life, meaning he was my best friend. We grew up, we saw each other every single day during school days and weekends. He was my closest friend. Even after we grew up, it's either he was always at my house or me, I'm always at his house. Babis was the person I would have called in that moment seeking help and seeking protection for him to guide me and help me and comfort me. Baris that was that person. And he was also that person that just died. 
every night I was going to sleep hoping that it was just a dream. I don't know if I could explain it more that I would sleep knowing it's true, waking up hoping it was fake. Not only hoping that it was fake, but I would pull out my phone and call Vanessa's number right away. Hoping, just for a... Uh, hello? Because your mind starts playing tricks at that point. You dream about him saying it's not true, what did you think? And then you wake up thinking, oh, alhamdulillah, it wasn't true, but everything was true. And so after he passes, I got a call from the police. And they're like, did you know that Bagas just passed? I'm like, yeah. And so they're like, all right, we're going to have to charge you with two counts of negligent driving, causing death. And you have to come tomorrow to the courthouse. I'm like, but tomorrow is Eid. I want just it's the one time I like this family time. Like, where I come the next day, they're like, no, if you don't come tomorrow, we come get you. And so I remember praying Eid and then driving right away to the courthouse for them to put me in a cell, for me to be sitting in a cell with my Eid clothes and doing my takbirat in a cell. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. And subhanAllah, I remember thinking, where's my life now? What's happening? Two weeks ago, everything was fine. We were signing up to school, going to a school, everything. Like me and my friends, and my life was normal. Two weeks later, I'm sitting in the jail cell with my best friend dead. And me possibly getting into prison or whatever was going to happen, jail. I didn't know, but that, to be honest, in that moment, I really didn't care. And subhanAllah, so then they process me, they realize I'm not a danger for society, so they put me under conditions until they give me the final verdict, I get to go back home. I also got a call from the school board. They're like, because this happened on the school's property, we don't think you should stay in this school and you should find another school. So not only did I lose my best friend, but I lost my friend support that was at that school that I was there for four years. Then I needed to find another school and I needed to find a different group of friends, but not only that, but my close friend just passed away and I have to deal with legal problems. I'm 17 years old. And subhanAllah, at that point, I had a choice to make. Either I find Allah in that moment. Either I get resentment, say, oh, why would God exist? Be upset or understand and thank Allah and be, have purpose in my life. Now, I know I'm telling you this and you're saying, obviously, the purpose of Allah, finding Allah is the better of the two choices. But I can tell you honestly, in that moment, none of my friends chose that. Everybody chose the other way around. Everybody started partying. Everybody started going to the clubs. Everybody started becoming worse and using drugs. And I remember sitting there, I'm like, this is it, halas. This is when I choose Allah. This is where I saw my friend dying and I am going to be next. There is no more tomorrow. There's only right now. And from that day on, is how I dedicated my life to Allah. So obviously I am very sad that that happened. And my friend passed away. But alhamdulillah, I found Allah. And one thing I can tell you, Every action that I do, every action that I do, I hope that virus gets has an effort. Every good deed, every dawa, every quadrant, every good thing I do, I ask Allah for you to give him has an effort. Because if it wasn't for him, I would be wired today. So I ask Allah to forgive him. <laughs> I think rather at the highest level of justice. Allah, I mean, that's how I found my path to change.